Did you ever see a movie that you totally skipped over during its original release, and like it so much that you go to search up news on the sequel, only to get your dreams crushed after you find out it was one of the biggest failures of all time, and most people don't even know it exists? Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's the summary of my experience with John Carter, the 2012 movie adaptation of Edgar Rice Burroughs' famous book series, John Carter of Mars. Today, Disney's John Carter is mostly remembered for being a massive bomb. So massive, in fact, it led to the current wave of safe, live-action remakes we're dealing with now. And everyone knows why it failed. John Carter was a high-budget, out-of-control production, based on an obscure book and doomed for failure. Well, not really. Contrary to popular belief, John Carter was actually smoothly produced and on budget. It was based on one of the most influential sci-fi books of all time. Books that influenced countless other works, from Star Wars to Avatar to Superman. Not to mention inspiring icons like Ronald Reagan and Carl Sagan. The more I looked into it, the more I saw how many misconceptions and general rumors there were going around about this movie. Too many people got the wrong idea about John Carter during release, and the oppression stuck. Seeing as it was a Disney movie, I decided it was on brand to take the time and clear things up. So, how could a $250 million movie, directed by Pixar legend Andrew Stanton, be such a legendary failure? How did a pioneer of sci-fi end up being seen as a ripoff of work it inspired? How could Disney mismanage this so badly? All this and more, next. Ever since Edgar Rice Burroughs published the first John Carter of Mars story in 1912, Hollywood has been trying to adapt the fantastic adventures into movies. Coincidentally, Burroughs also wrote Tarzan, and Hollywood made dozens of movies for that series, which made sense. Even early special effects could depict Tarzan's realistic jungle world. They wouldn't touch Barsoom, which is the term for Mars in the Carter books. See, the world of John Carter is packed with weird aliens, airships, and shapeshifters. It's bonkers, to put it bluntly. The effects just weren't there yet. For live action, anyway. In the mid-1930s, Bob Clampett, a director of Looney Tunes fame, pitched an animated adaptation of John Carter to MGM, who actually greenlit the project. The animated John Carter made some decent progress, and would have beat Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs to be the first animated feature film. Sadly, MGM killed it when booking agents and exhibitors expressed concern over the source material. They were worried audiences weren't ready for the outlandish world of Mars. In the following decades, there were a couple more attempts to adapt John Carter, but nothing really got off the ground. Still, its influence was felt in countless other works, there are elements of John Carter in Ray Bradbury's work, for example, in the novel Dune, and even in Star Wars, both the original and prequel trilogy. In fact, one of the biggest movies of all time, James Cameron's Avatar, was inspired by John Carter. Cameron would say that Avatar was outright modeled on the John Carter series. By 1986, Disney, under new CEO Mike Eisner, was looking for an answer to Star Wars, and John Carter of Mars was a good fit. They bought the rights and tried their luck. Like MGM, they couldn't get a handle on the movie. They began production with John McTiernan, director of Predator and the Die Hard series. However, the project moved very slowly and went through as many as seven rewrites. By 1991, the company made a little progress, casting Tom Cruise and Julia Roberts, but there was still no progress on actually filming. It was the effects problem again. The world of Mars, the landscape and creatures, had to be convincing. Practical effects weren't enough, and CGI was very expensive. McTiernan decided the project was too advanced and dropped out in 1993. Finally, facing a massive budget of $120 million, Disney killed the project, and they lost the rights in 2000. That same year, Paramount gained the rights, and they tried to get their version of John Carter off the ground. 
They went through multiple directors, including Robert Rodriguez and Kerry Conran, who both dropped out for various reasons. Paramount's final choice was John Favreau, but it wasn't long before the studio lost interest in favor of upcoming movies like Iron Man and Star Trek. Faced with a lack of interest, and again, a massive budget, they let the rights expire in 2006. The news of the John Carter rights being up for grabs reached Pixar director Andrew Stanton. Stanton was a huge fan of John Carter, having read them as a kid. He convinced Disney Studio chairman Dick Cook to acquire the rights. Stanton would then start production on John Carter of Mars. The problems with John Carter began right about now. Dick Cook approved a $150 million budget at first, and pretty much gave Stanton free reign to do as he pleased, even though this was Stanton's first live-action movie. While this may seem foolish in hindsight, Disney also doubted Stanton when he directed Finding Nemo and Wally, and those turned out to be massive successes. Most importantly, Stanton was the number two at Pixar, so he had a lot of influence in the company. Cook was inclined to keep him satisfied, so he didn't interfere too much in John Carter's development. Of course, this wasn't only a favor to Stanton. Before Disney bought Marvel in 2009, they were in need of a reliable boy franchise, and the action-packed adventures of John Carter could easily be the next big thing. So with a director and an approved budget, all the pieces were in place for John Carter of Mars to finally hit the big screen. Andrew Stanton had full creative control of John Carter, and he set out to make the movie he wanted. Thanks to Disney's lack of oversight, he had final say on the screenplay, casting, and production. Stanton avoided casting the A-listers you would expect to headline a $250 million movie. Instead, he went with lesser-known actors for the two leads, Taylor Kitsch for John Carter and Lynn Collin for the princess Dejah Thoris. This didn't directly impact the quality of the movie, but it did hurt the mass market appeal. There's a reason studios pay so much for The Rock or Robert Downey Jr. In any case, the lesser known actors did keep costs down, which was surely appreciated because this was one expensive film. As this was Stanton's first live action movie, it was unclear how he would adapt. He approached it the Pixar way, which emphasized trial and error. This meant additional shooting months after initial production was over. He consulted with his Pixar colleagues more than he did with experienced live-action filmmakers. Throw in the producers, who were Pixar alumni, and you had what some call the first Pixar live-action film. Stanton was so sure of Carter's success, he was planning a trilogy when Disney hadn't even greenlit a sequel yet. He really did think that his method, the Pixar process, was better for live action, though the additional shooting would bring some bad publicity later on. You may remember the media narrative of heavy reshoots plaguing John Carter, and ballooning its budget to the sky. This wasn't true. Stanton made heavy use of additional shooting because of his dedication to the Pixar filmmaking process. But he certainly didn't get out of control, and production mostly proceeded as planned. Now, right before production, the budget did increase from $150 million to $250 million. This was due to the heavy use of special effects. The 12-foot-tall Martian Tharks were major characters, and a considerable portion of the budget was used to make them look convincing. And even besides the main aliens, the world of John Carter, with its animals and landscapes, required a lot of time and manpower to create. To give you an idea of how much effects were required, there were actually more animated shots in John Carter than in Wally -E or Finding Nemo. This wasn't an inflated, extravagant production. Stanton really did need $250 million to make the movie he wanted, and he used what he was granted. Now, the studio could have requested Stanton to rework the script so as to reduce the effects needed, but Dick Cook was confident in Stanton's box office results. After all, Wally -E and Finding Nemo were some of the highest grossing movies ever, so why mess with the master? By mid-2009, Stanton had finished the screenplay and cast elites. The project was moving forward swimmingly, 
but it would soon be hit with the first of many setbacks. In the summer of 2009, Disney suddenly acquired Marvel. The company already had multiple divisions to maintain, including Disney Animation Studios, Pixar, and various live action studios. Now Marvel was part of the family, and it meant trouble for John Carter. See, part of the reason Disney approved John Carter was to start a franchise targeted to boys. With the Marvel deal, Disney got hundreds of boy characters and a rapidly growing cinematic universe, which was the basis for countless licensing opportunities. Best of all, the franchises were set up already. All Disney had to do with Marvel was to finance and market the movies and other projects. On the other hand, we have John Carter of Mars, which was an in-house project. You may have noticed by now, but Disney CEO Bob Iger is an acquisition guy through and through. After he bought Marvel, he had little interest in John Carter, which was expensive and wasn't even a surefire hit. It could appeal to boys, sure, but it didn't have an active fan base. Even now, years after John Carter flopped, nobody really knows the Barsoom series. And I say this as a fan. Also, Dick Cook was fired in September 2009, leaving John Carter without an advocate in the company. His replacement, Rich Ross, was the former head of TV at Disney, and Bob Iger told him to clean house and update the studio. He was new to movies, but he understood how much Marvel meant to the company, and what little John Carter had to offer. Ross could have reduced John Carter's budget, but by the time he arrived, the movie was too far in development, and Stanton's clout in the company kept his project safe. Still, all this meant the higher-ups at Disney saw John Carter of Mars as more of a tiresome distraction than a major opportunity. John Carter didn't fit under Marvel, or Pixar, or a regular family-focused Disney release. It was out of place, and it would suffer for it. Disney approved a massive $100 million marketing budget for John Carter. That's something more fitting of an Avengers movie than an unproven franchise like the Mars novels. All this money came with a catch though. Disney planned a regular marketing campaign for John Carter. This meant no creative cross-promotion, no merchandising deals, and no mass licensing. Just billboards and trailers. You can see how Disney was setting up this movie for failure. Speaking of failure, even with $100 million, Carter's marketing was infamously bad. From the very beginning of development in 2007 till mid-2011, Disney put no effort into advertising or anything. Sure, they had press releases for key announcements, but nothing else. No trailers, no interviews, and next to zero social media. And even after marketing started, social media continued to be anemic, with only a few posts a month, and boring posts at that. It wasn't until May 2011 that Disney began the marketing for John Carter. And to start it off, they shot themselves in the foot. They changed the movie's title from John Carter of Mars to just John Carter. Just a few months before, Mars Needs Moms tanked at the box office. So Disney wanted to avoid a similar fate with John Carter of Mars. Also, Disney reasoned that the word Mars added a geeky tone to the title and would drive women away. Their words, not mine. The title change seemed simple enough at first, but it had major consequences. For one, the change went over badly in the film slash sci-fi community. John Carter of Mars was exciting, mysterious. How did John Carter get to Mars? What was he doing? Most of all, it was unique. It could only be about the Burroughs books. John Carter, on the other hand, was a lame title. Who was John Carter? It could be a movie about anyone. Yep. John Carter of Mars. Sounds much better. It was a terrible title change, and it showed the community that Disney's movie could not be trusted. And I emphasize Disney. 
By this time, Disney had stopped using labels like Touchstone and Buena Vista to release its movies. There was only Disney, Marvel, and Pixar. This meant John Carter was branded as a regular Disney movie, which was kind of a problem. Even though Disney saw John Carter as a movie for young boys, that just wasn't reality. If you haven't read the John Carter books, they feature plenty of violence, politics, and other mature themes. Kids still enjoyed them, but they were written with adults in mind. The fact that Disney kept their branding on the posters, etc., meant many Carter fans, and the average Joe, assumed the movie was softened for young audiences. You couldn't blame them either. The Disney marketing team never mentioned the original books, or Edgar Rice Burroughs. No Mars, no Barsoom, no Burroughs. How are fans supposed to know this was based on the John Carter series? The first thing Warner Brothers did with the new Dune movie was to show off its roots, and that adaptation doesn't even need it. To top it all off, even as the marketing was aimed at kids, the company refused to treat the movie as a blockbuster. There was no toy line, and no fast food, happy meal things. It doesn't take a marketing expert to see what a disaster the campaign was, even a few months before release. Disney's posters and billboards were bland and unexciting, a far cry from the immersive world of the books. I mean, look at these illustrations. John Carter's adventures are full of action, romance, imagination. But the marketing material could be about anything. It made John Carter look like a generic sci-fi movie, not an adaptation of the grandfather of sci-fi. There was no sense of action, adventure, or romance in posters like these. Yes, romance is a core theme of John Carter, but you wouldn't have known it from Disney's marketing. They barely featured the love interest, Princess Deja Thoris, even though she's ubiquitous in literally any other illustration of the series. Unfortunately, this was another blunder that would drive away mature viewers. In my opinion, Disney's obsession with keeping John Carter a boys movie doomed it from the start. This was a movie with broad appeal, much like Avatar was. And remember, Avatar was based on John Carter of Mars. When I saw you, I believed it's something new. The trailers made no effort to differentiate John Carter from other sci-fi or action movies. If it wasn't seen as a ripoff of Avatar, it was seen as a Prince of Persia clone. The trailers never showed off the splendor of Mars, or John's backstory, or the princess. They didn't even hype the director as the guy behind Wally and Finding Nemo. It's no surprise that the best trailer for John Carter turned out to be a fan made one. Not all of us. It was his private journal. I possibly find some kind of explanation in here. It was the only one to show off some of Carter's backstory, the only one to show off the director and the heritage of the books, and it was the only one to underline the romance aspect. The only real publicity John Carter got was the negative reporting about the high budget, or the out of control production, or the box office numbers it needed to reach. Whether it was true or not, the media had a narrative about John Carter, the narrative being it was an expensive, arrogant mistake that would backfire on Disney. Train wrecks are fun to watch, and fun to report, and Carter was crashing in real time. You would expect Disney to deny the rumors and put the gossip to rest, but they didn't. Only Stanton himself defended the movie, while the company paid no attention. The continuous bad press would be the main source of publicity throughout the build-up to release. In all, John Carter was a tentpole movie with no tentpole efforts behind the marketing, and the consequences of this were right around the corner. By the end of 2011, John Carter only had a fraction of the hype that the Avengers had, even though it was from the same company. It was falling way behind The Hunger Games, which was releasing a week after, 
and was even struggling against the Lorax, releasing one week before on March 2. Box office forecasts were not looking good, and journalists made sure to let the world know. While the movie is remembered today for being a massive failure, the content itself wasn't too bad. It's true that critics were indifferent, and that led to even more bad press. The horrible marketing made the movie dependent on reviews, and when that Rotten Tomatoes score reached the 50s, it was pretty much a game over. It didn't help that so many critics and viewers saw the movie as a Disney-fied Avatar ripoff, or a Star Wars ripoff. It didn't matter. After 100 years, John Carter's influence was in everything. Yet people still didn't know the heritage of the source material. The marketing was that bad. There was article after article of bad press about the movie's failure. And sure enough, in its opening weekend, John Carter opened second with $30 million behind the Lorax. Disney decided to act quickly, but not in the way you would expect. Just 10 days after opening, the studio announced it was writing off $200 million thanks to John Carter's performance. The press exploded. John Carter was officially Hollywood's worst failure ever. Ironically, this was also the most publicity the movie ever got. In any case, any hope for an extended theatrical run was gone, only 10 days into release. The hype about the $200 million loss, and John Carter itself, were quickly overshadowed by The Hunger Games later in the month, and forgotten entirely by the time The Avengers released. And just like that, John Carter's time in the spotlight, however little it was, was gone. Disney needed John Carter to gross about $500 million to make a profit. It ended up making $284 million worldwide. This was a movie with everything going for it. A master director, an exciting book, advanced effects, and a competent cast. But a dumpster fire of a marketing campaign and zero interest from the company's executives sealed its fate. It's truly shocking how a movie with $350 million put into it was allowed to die so easily. The funny thing is, Disney never felt the John Carter crash. The $200 million loss was quickly absorbed, and they moved on to the Avengers the next month. The MCU was a more reliable boy franchise anyway. They even got their sci-fi boy franchise when they acquired Star Wars later that year. Actually, Star Wars probably affected John Carter earlier. In the book, John Carter and the Gods of Hollywood, author Michael Sellers makes the case that Disney was fine with the movie bombing because they had already lined up Star Wars, which was a simple plug-and-play franchise, not a complicated in-house project. On a personal note, I'm thankful John Carter was made. I ended up reading the books because of the negative publicity the movie got and I can proudly say they hold up even 100 years after release. I'm sure there are countless others who became fans after watching the movie itself. And for that, I thank Andrew Stanton for expanding the fan base of the Barsoom books, even in the face of failure. And honestly, even though the movie isn't my absolute favorite, it's still worth a watch. Needless to say, any plans for a sequel were trashed, and Disney let the rights to John Carter expire in 2014. The Burroughs estate has vowed to get John Carter back on screen someday, and I hope they succeed. Well, that's all I have to say about that. I hope you enjoyed this dive into a forgotten movie. It's gotten a bad rap for too long, so I hope I managed to clear things up. If you want to learn more about the movie, I recommend reading John Carter and the Gods of Hollywood. It's an in-depth look at the movie's development, and was one of my main sources for this video. And that's about it. If you like what you saw, please hit that like button and subscribe for more Disney content. Till next time, see you later.